الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم everybody وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله Inshallah, Ramadan is treating you all well. Um, this is the 11th segment of ISR, Inshallah, and we would like to send the thawaw of this session to our Imam Tah bin Asr al-Saman through the recitation of Dua al-Fajr, Inshallah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma kun li waliyika bi hazzatin min hasan salawatik alayhi wa ala abai fi hadhihi saati wa fi kulli saa wa liya wa yuhafiza wa qa'ida wa nasira wa dalila wa ayna hatta tuzginahu arda tatawa wa tumitahu fiha tawila bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alibayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad so, so far in our sar, we've been discussing uh, hadith and nafs by Imam Ali alayhi salam, and we've looked at three of the four souls described in this hadith, the plantic soul, the animalistic soul, and the divine intellectual soul or human soul. We've also said that the soul, the last one, is in potential, and we've discussed four, the four things that we should do to be able to actualize the soul. And these four things are loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, loving Yahlul Bayt, Dhikr, and hanging out with the right people. However, it's not as easy as it seems because there are these barriers in the way which stop us from achieving this. And these barriers have one common origin. So the barrier to loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pride. The barrier to loving our Yahlul Bayt is envy. The barrier to Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greed. And the barrier to hanging out with the right people or finding the most appropriate people to be uh, writing the Aqlam on us uh, is hate. And all these come from one common cause, which is our ego. So inshallah, today's lecture is going to be aimed at looking at the ego, its origins, its benefits, and what, why, it leads to these four things and how this can be destructive in our path in trying to achieve Kamal, inshallah. So the first thing that we want to look at is what is the thing which is leading us towards Kamal? Allah, we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a fatra, a compass which leads to good. And this fatra wants us to achieve this greater stage. So it wants us to actualize our human soul by following these four things. The opposite of fatra is shaitan. And it's not necessarily just iblis, but it's all forms of shayateen and ins wal jinn. So we need to look at why this, uh, why shaitan is the opposite of fatra, how it leads to the corruption, say, of our path towards um, kamal, through putting the ego in place and putting these barriers to the uh, to the four steps of actualization. So this is given to us in the Quran. And in Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the creation of Adam alayhi salam and when he orders the malaika to prostrate to Adam alayhi salam. Iblis refuses to do so because he says, you've created him from mud and I am created from fire. So, um, why have you honored him above me? Or, you have honored him above me. And so, the, and so because he's refused, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then you must, uh, um, you know, abide to the consequences of your actions, which is to go to hell. And Shaitan says, no, if you delay me, until the day of resurrection, I will surely destroy his descendants. And he's talking about the descendants of Adam, except a few. 
And the last apparatus that perplexed him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not refuse this. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies, Go, for whoever of them follows you, indeed, how will be the uh, recompense of you? Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is saying that the shaitan is here to what? Lead us astray lead us away from what we're truly meant to be which is come on he wants to destroy our pure entity it's his purpose and whoever follows the shaitan suffers the same fate as him and here we don't mean that shaitan is only doing wesweta to us and leading us towards hell but following in his actions we say to ourselves that we need to follow the Ahlul Bayt by um, reflecting and copying their actions within the appropriate context. Well, the same applies here. The people who follow Shaytan by replicating his actions will also suffer the same fate as Shaytan. So what is this action that Shaytan has committed here? It is arrogance. He believes that he is superior to Adam Islam, just because of what he's made out of. And he does not want Adam to ha occupy a greater position in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compared to himself. So his ego was his downfall. And we can see that pride, hate, envy, um, pride, hate, envy, and greed all play a role in this um, scenario as well. So the shaitan hated Adam because of all the uh, glory and honor that he's been given. He envies Adam's position. He's greedy because he wanted to keep his position as the highest cre uh, creature um, and not want to share it with, uh, with Adam alayhi salam. And of course, his pride is what led him to believe that he's much greater. So all these four stem from his ego. Um, so yeah, we need to be very careful because as we said, Iblis, he can only do what's ours. But there are other shay shayateen who can detrimentally affect our path. And who are they? They are the shayateen of ignorance. The people who are jump who may be jumping on the trampoline next to us and dampening our height. So they are reducing our height and um, um, opposing to letting us increase and go higher and higher up. So the thing we have to first discuss before we can move on is what is the ego? And so Generally, when we think of the ego, we think of this negative thing, this negative thing which comes from self-importance and um, believing that, you know, you are everything. However, we neglect, uh, we also rename it to make it look positive. We call it self-esteem as well. But the truth is these are both the same thing. The ego is simply the way that we recognize ourselves in this world. All right, so imagine, remember the example of the ocean where we said with a lot of limitation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is similar to this ocean and we are the waves. If this wave became conscious of itself and does not recognize that it is simply part of the ocean, that is the ego of the wave and this applies to us as well. So the truth is though, the ego, like everything else, was given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a real true purpose. And it comes from and with, accompanied with, the animalistic soul. Because without the ego, we cannot survive. If we did not find that our life is important and worth living so that we can actualize and then move to the akhirah, then we wouldn't put the effort to try and keep ourselves alive. We require the self-importance for this purpose. And so what it does is it prevents us from killing our own potential. 
because we recognize that it exists. So for example, this is why some people learn for uh, self-defense or why we listen to the doctor and take our medication or why our parents go out and they work so that they can make money so that we can live and survive. And this all comes from our ego. However, as always, the ego has its negative sides. Because it's purely about recognizing our existence and not the existence of everything else, it makes it seem that we are the center of everything and that everything around us orbits our existence instead of the truth, which should be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the center of all existence and we all orbit around him. And we don't mean orbit literally, but figuratively, meaning that everything in our life revolves around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we, um, we role play this physically in the, um, when we do tawaf and hajj, because what we're doing is we're reflecting this exact thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the center of all that we are, that all that has ever existed and will ever exist. And so we are orbiting around that. Where does this ego come from? And when does it come about? And the thing is, we're not exactly born with an ego, not like the animalistic soul. We develop it. It's something that we learn. So a baby, when it realizes that there's pain in its stomach, it wants to stop that pain because pain is uncomfortable for the child. So, but it doesn't know how to. And it recognizes that it doesn't have the free will yet or the capacity to be able to stop this pain. It can't magically make it disappear. So what it does is it starts crying from this pain and when it starts crying somebody comes along the mother and it feeds the child and the pain goes away so what the child learns is that if he cries then someone will come and stop his suffering this is the first instance where a child learns to become self-aware aware of his own needs and his own desires. However, a child at this stage does not have awareness of others. It does not recognize that when it cries at 2 a.m. in the morning, it's disturbing its parents' sleep. It doesn't have that awareness yet. And that's what we mean by the ego. Because the ego is about your own awareness with disregard to everything else. So a child learns this. However, as Muslims, as people interacting in society, we also require awareness of others. And this is why we teach children, toddlers, to share, to wait for their turn, and to say thank you when they get something. We teach them how to become aware of others. Just as they taught themselves how to become aware of themselves, we have to teach them to become aware of others. So the ego has its benefits. Because without the, the ego, then we have no will or strive to survive because we don't recognize that we exist. But once we recognize that we exist and we have our life in order, it becomes harmful and toxic. It's very similar in a way as a medical uh, leech. So when uh, somebody needs to get um, their limb like say their finger was chopped off and they needed to get stitched back, leeches are used in medicine to get the circulation back into this new limb. So for example, with the finger, they put the leech in the end of the finger and the leech um, causes vasodilation and it causes the blood to go up into this finger again, which means that this finger is now alive again. But if we leave the leech on the tip of the finger for too long, it's going to suck more and more blood and it may cause us some problems. It may cause someone to faint if it's enough blood to cause them to faint. So with this leech 
it has its use for a period amount of time, but when, then we need to get rid of it because then it becomes a parasite. And this thing, the same thing applies with our ego. It's very useful for a child for them to be able to get a hold of their uh, purpose on this world. Because without their ego, they won't need a purpose. They won't feel like there's a sense of um, purpose. And if you don't understand what purpose is, then how are you going to strive towards come on? So it's very important. But once a child reaches Bidur, they no longer require it. And they no longer require it because they're trying to now strive towards Kamal. And this ego will become a hindrance to that from now on. Something else that we want to add. It's very bad for somebody to kill their ego before this point. So say uh, a child, four years old, if they don't have an ego by then, it's going to be detrimental to their development further on. So if someone is getting bullied at school or uh, their parents are always disappointed with them or um, they're always told that you don't know enough, you need to learn more and more and more, their self-esteem is going to be pretty low and they're going to feel worthless. And so they're not going to question their sense of purpose and they're not going to strive to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about Yawmin al-Akhirah. So that is the reason why we need the ego to develop in children. Because without this development, there's nothing inside the cage for them to break free. Okay? Because the ego is this cage, right? If they don't have a cage, they don't have it in a test, okay? How are they going to pass or fail? They can't. So what happens is they do end up being purposeless or worthless. And that's really unfortunate. So inshallah, what we can take from this is that we, ha we have had the capacity inshallah to develop our ego, but now it's time for us to shatter it because we no longer need it. Now we're going to look at how the ego stops us from being able to actualize our human soul, inshallah. And so we're going to start with the first one, which is pride. So what pride is defined as, it's this, um, you know, love for oneself. Okay, so when you do something and you're really um, happy with the results, you become proud because you're like, this is my doing, correct? So when does this become a problem? When you stop recognizing that things are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, when you start to believe that you are an equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do we mean by that? It means that you decide what you want to take from Allah's system and what you don't want to take. We don't necessarily only mean in a religious sense. We mean in science, we mean everything. So there are people who say, read science, or let's just take the Quran for now. They read the Quran, they're like, I love this verse, I'm going to apply it. I'm not a big fan of this one. It doesn't work for me. What you're doing is you're changing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's system, and that's not okay. And the reason for that is yes, because you love yourself. And remember, if we go back to the idea of shirk, we said there was shirk al-amali and shirk al-qalbi. And when you love yourself, what you're doing is you're creating someone who is an equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart, which is yourself. And this is shirk al-qalbi. And the problem with shirk al-qalbi is it's very easily transferred into shirk al-amali. And a great example of this is given to us in the Quran. And they are the people of Ad. So the people of Ad were, um, they lived in a desert, but there were fountains in the desert. So there was a water grotto underneath, and they were able to access water from there and create a beautiful, uh, green, fertile land for themselves. Um, they were also blessed with physical strength from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, because they're in the middle of nowhere, nobody came to, uh, to trade with them. 
So what they did was they built this beautiful city called Eran, which was a huge tourist attraction pretty much. And so many merchants would come their way to buy their goods and sell with them, but also to enjoy the glory of this magnificent um, building a uh, city that they had created, which they carved out of stone. And so another thing that the people of Iram would do was they had a great respect for um, their elders from the past. And so whenever somebody died, they would not only bury them, but they would create a monument for them. And this image here is of the kings and queens of England. So people today still do this where when somebody important dies, they create a monument of them so that they can remember them, all right? So this is what Ad did. However, and they were all at this time mu'mineen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, over time, they began to reduce their dependence, say, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of they no longer believe that what they have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but from their own doing. They believed that they had the physic the reason that they were able to create Iram, this magnificent place, was because of their physical strength. And because they were winning all these wars and they were getting all this money, they believed that they were invincible. And so how can they attribute this invincibility to their respected elders? These monuments that they had of their elders were no longer monuments to remember them by, but they were traits that they admired in their elders. And sooner and later, these became idols. And how do we know that, you know, they didn't just have idols to start off with? Well, look at the names of these idols. al Saqiya, al Salima. All these are actually names which can be translated to attributes of people. So the water of, the peaceful, the giver, the protectors. These reflect the attributes that their elders had. And they loved these attributes so much that they actually started worshipping them. And at this stage, this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Nabi Hud alayhi salam. So that he can advise the people that these monuments are only for to respect your elders, but they are not your gods. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about Al Ad when they did not believe their prophet? He says, They were arrogant upon the earth. And this arrogance stems from what? From their ego. Their pride stems from their ego. The fact that they believed that they were invincible stemmed from their ego. So how does this story, and then of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, brought his adab upon um, the people of Ad. How does the story reflect or how is this similar to us today? The problem is we live with a lot of people of Ad in our day and age. But if we're looking specifically at ourselves, there's one big thing that we can draw as a parallel to this story, and it is addiction. So, remember we have a quarter of a day to spend doing the things which make us happy, the things that we love. However, if these things take a part of our heart, which is not with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they can become a shirk of the heart. And if we continue to practice them on a routine kind of basis, what happens is that they become shirk amen. And the reason for, and like a good example for that is someone who's really immersed, say, in video games. And they play video games for a very long time, and the time of Adan comes, and they have to go and pray. You'd be like, oh, don't want to pray now, and they'll leave it off until it becomes qawwa, say, or they get really annoyed, but they get up and pray. The reason why they feel annoyed is because playing games has become as important to them as talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or even greater. And that is 
a form of shirk, shirk in our name. But the thing is, it's not limited to just video games, anything, reading, uh, watching sports, playing sports, exercising, being healthy, all these kind of things can become really bad addictions. Um, so what we can take away from this is when you start seeing that something is becoming a routine, even if it's good in a sense, so like studying, for example, if it becomes a routine and a priority above the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked for, then you know that you have a problem, that you have an addiction. And so what you need to do is to break this routine. I know it's really hard because you feel like your entire world is revolved around a structured system. And when you break the structured system, it may feel confusing. But it's better to break the system than to continue and pursue it and resulting in shirk. So the second one of the four is envy. And we said envy is the um, thing which stops us from loving Ahlul Bayt. Envy is defined as a displeasure or a want for something that somebody else has. It's different from jealousy because jealousy usually stems from a fear or a fear from um, not being as good as something else. So uh, jealousy comes from comparing yourself with someone else and really being annoyed that you're not that or you don't have that. Whereas envy is different because it, stem, it doesn't stem from fear. It stems from a yearning. So you really want this thing. You don't fear of not have. You don't fear not having it. That's the difference. And so, when it comes to envy, how does this link to Ahlul Bayt? Well, we know our Ahlul Bayt are Masumin. And so, what some people start to think is like, I'll never get there. I'll never be able um, to become insan Kamil because they're Masumin. They're perfect. What am I? When they start to do this, what happens is like, well, there you go. I'm going to give up on what they think and I am going to try and get there in my own way. The Quran is there. That's our primary guide. I'll just follow the Quran. No need for the Ahlul Bayt. And unfortunately, most Muslims around the world are from this path. They don't believe in our Ahlul Bayt. And the reason why they don't believe in our Ahlul Bayt, even though they don't recognize it, is because of this envy that they have towards them. And envy comes in these two forms. So the first form is not listening to them. And that's what we said, where they just disregard the Ahlul Bayt and simply follow the Quran to what they think the Quran says. But the second one is copying them out of context. So what this means is, say someone is really in love with the Ahlul Bayt, right? But they don't see how they can be like them. They're like, oh, there's no way for me to become a muscle. So instead what they do, they're like, we're just going to do everything like them. We're going to copy them in everything. However, they don't recognize that each of the imams had a specific role. And so if you want to copy the imams, you need to copy them to what best suits your situation and what the context of their situation was. So an example for um, this is... Um, for example, someone who goes and protests uh, for in front of the government, say, for uh, removal of some rights of other people, uh, let's say, any, um, they don't agree with gay marriage, so they're going to sit in front of the parliament and protest it, because that's what Imam Hussein did. However, we recognize that in our day and age, that is not the best solution. If the imams are here, this is not what they would be doing. Instead, they would be doing what Imam al-Kadhim uh, was doing, which is educating people in a humble manner and ensuring that the message spreads without being public about it, without opposing the tyrant directly, but opposing them passively. So that is what it means by copying them out of context, okay? And the reason why 
both of these are bad is because we don't realize that we are actually becoming enemies of our ethnic base by doing these two things. Inshallah, we'll get to back to how this occurs, but the first thing that we're going to do is give an example from the Quran of how envy can lead to the creation of enemies and drastic measures after that. And the best example of this is Qabi. So we know that Qabin and Habin are both the children of Adam alayhi salam. Qabin was a farmer, but he was a lazy farmer, didn't really do much, whereas Habib was a shepherd, a very dedicated shepherd. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked for both of them to give him an offering. So both Qabin and Habib came with their offerings, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the offering of Habib. And the reason for that is because it doesn't do, it's not about what you offer, it's about how you come about this offering. So the amount of work they put in and the intentions behind the offering. So Qabi obviously did not understand this and he became very envious of what his brother had achieved. And this envy led him to kill his brother. And the important thing here is what led him to um, uh, kill his brother, what led to this envy, and it's himself, nafsa, and his self permitted him to murder his brother. <coughs> So when it comes to our day and age, when we're trying to, you know, look at how this story applies to us, we see these two sides of envy, uh, of ethnic bank. The first one is we're not going to follow it, and the second one is we're going to copy them, copy them out of context. So not following them is by pick and choosing what we want or interpreting the Quran in our own manner, which is not okay. The second one, as I said, is when we pick specific events from our from the lives of our life and bait and say that this purely represents them and this is what you're going to do. And unfortunately one of the um one of the Ahl bait who is truly, truly misjudged because of this assumption is our lady Fatima his son. And the reason for that is because people only pick two events of her life, Khutbat Fadak and, uh, and the events which occurred to her house when people stormed in to try and kill Imam Ali alayhi salam. They pick these two events and they pitch women of Islam as people who need to stand up um, and publicly project their opinion and, you know, become leaders, say, in their communities by actively taking a high position and that kind of thing. They pitch it as if it's feminism or something, but that's completely taking Our Lady out of context because she's not about that. She's about being a uh, incredible nurturer and to create and put the seeds for growing the next generation. She's about protecting people even if it's harsh protection, as we said, she's the surgeon, but she's protected the Ummah, she protected the true Islam. That's her true purpose. And so what this happens, what this will do, is it will blindside us to the true message of Ahl bayt So when our Imam Abdullah Ta'ala Faraj al-Sharif comes back, we won't even recognize him. Not only won't we recognize him if we do, we'll, uh, when we see someone, we'll say, this is a fake and we'll fight against them. If that is the Imam, we are the enemies of the Imam and we're physically fighting against him. That's really bad, but that's what envy can do to us. So to be able to stop out, and then we need to look at it outside the context of simply just us with Ahl Bayt, because the thing is, there are many uh, Wakilin or people who manifest the attributes of Ahl Bayt around us. And we want those people to be our Aliyah, correct? However, what happens is that when we see these people around us, we get disgusted by them. We're like, oh my gosh, they're trying too hard. What is this? We think it's Riyah. However, 
It may not be. We must not come up with these conclusions when we see someone reciting Quran beautifully. And so there is a hadith, a beautiful hadith from our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which says, Ahmil akhak mu'min ala sab'in mahmalan min al khair. So give your Muslim brother 70 excuses before making judgment upon them. And that's what we need to apply in our daily lives. The third of them is greed. And we said greed is the opposite of the kaf. And so greed, quite obvious by the definition, is the attempt to try and add to your self-worth. Okay? So Scrooge McDuck is a very good example of this. And so this doesn't necessarily mean wealth. We usually attribute it to wealth and materialistic things, but it, that's not true. It can be fame, it could be attention. These are all things we are greedy for because what they do is they validate our self-worth. But if we continue on this path, we are just increasing the amount of branch, uh, roots that we have in our dunya. And it becomes more difficult for us to transition to the akhirah. We have this sense of ownership, and the sense of ownership comes from our ego. Because our ego wants to keep itself alive. It doesn't want to die out. So what it does is it creates more pain for us. And to uh, be able to remove this pain, we need to add more to ourselves. So this trampoline example, it's beautiful. If we remove, if, so we're trying to reach up and we have these roots, even if we remove all the roots, there's still something from stopping us, still something stopping us from soaring up. And it's our own weight. Our own weight is this ego. So this is the final thing that we need to do to detach ourselves from the material world. However, it's fighting because it wants to stay alive. Um, a good example of this in the Quran is Qanun. So Qanun is one of the Ashab of Musa alayhi salam. In fact, he was the person in charge of the money of Bani Israel. However, he became very greedy and he started to recognize that, you know, this is actually my doing. This isn't a position I was given by Musa alayhi salam or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, I am smart and, I'm, and I have all this wealth now. And... He did not want to share it with Bani Israel. And so because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually sunk him and all his belongings and he died because of that. And in the Quran, what it says about him is that he believed it was from himself, his own knowledge. And that was his downfall. His greed was stemmed from what? His ego. So how we can apply it into our, into our daily life, we can we just try to add to our self-worth. It doesn't have to be money, it could be experiences. So a lot of people want to have more experience. Um, something else it could be is knowledge. A lot of people just hoard knowledge without applying the knowledge or spreading the knowledge, which is wrong. And followers, so if you're into social media, people believe that they get validated when more people like their posts or whatever. And what we're seeing now is hoarding and greed is such a big part because they believe they can't survive without it. That's not good. A way to solve this is very easy. It's by recognizing that nothing is yours in this dunya. Because when nothing is yours in this dunya, you don't grow an attachment to it. And the first thing we need to do is force ourselves to remember this. This may be difficult, but we need to force ourselves. Before you do everything, you say Bismillah, and after you finish any, every, anything, you say Alhamdulillah. Make this part of your routine. Make it part of your family rules to do this, because when you uh, keep it as a strict thing that you do, inshallah, you'll get the reward for it later on. The next one is hate, and hate is defined as a great dislike to someone. And so what hate generally does is it separates or disconnects you from other people. If you hate somebody, you don't want to associate with them at all. However, that's not the real problem. I mean, hate is good when it comes to um, 
people who are super bad, like Yazid and stuff, we know that we are allowed a degree of hate towards these people. Remember, they have potential, we're meant to love this potential, but everything else about them and the fact that they kill their potential, we can hate. However, there are two forms of hate, conscious and unconscious. So the conscious hate is the one that you recognize now, the one that you feel towards people. And generally, what you do is you try to screw up this person as much as possible because you don't want them to succeed. You don't want to increase their ego. And what that does is it increases your own ego because it makes you feel like you're dominant over them. This is conscious hate. However, there is a lot of hate which is unconscious. And this unconscious hate um, can be recognized when you see yourself ignoring people or not taking on what they're saying on board. And that's kind of scary because there's a lot of us who there are a lot of people in our life which, you know, attempt to ride on us, but we just erase it because we're like, that's not worth it. And when you're making someone feel worthless to you, what you're doing is you're validating yourself. And that comes from the ego. And so, psychologically, the origins of hate come from fear and disapproval. Fear of something which is different and perhaps the stereotypes which go around it. And so this brings, um, this gives birth to a lot of racism around the world. But disapproval is when somebody's doing something that you dislike. Maybe it's something haram, maybe it isn't. But you do not approve of what they're doing. What you're going to do is you're going to distance yourself from them because this person you do not want associated with you. Remember, putting barriers between you and that other person, all right? And the thing is, both of these are justified in some cases. So for example, with the example of fear, if somebody is a tyrant or likes a tyrant, so someone, for example, follows um, or is in the military, for example, under a tyrant, you would have a justification to fear them because they could cause you harm. Same with disapproval. If somebody is doing something super bad, you don't want to be part of it. You don't want it to imprint on your form in the Akhra, so you're going to remove yourself from them. However, that's not the case all the time. And what, why we have excessive form of um, hate due to fear and disapproval is because we're constantly comparing ourselves to everything. And when we're constantly comparing ourselves to everything, we're creating these relation links between people, between us and people or us and things. If we don't compare and we simply acknowledge its existence, we know we don't put this link. And when we don't put a link, we're able to appreciate and love it for what it is. If we put a link, however, we have to sit on one side of the fence or the other. It's either, yes, we approve and they're coming closer to us, or no, we disapprove and we hate them and they're moving away. And an example of this, unconscious fear, is the people of paradise. Ashab al-Jannah in the Quran. So in Surah Al-Qalam, we're told the story of these three brothers who have this beautiful paradise. So this beautiful orchard and all this fruit because I have so much of this, many poor people come to get their food from there. But these brothers, they don't like that. They don't want to be associated with the poor. And so what they end up doing is they hatch a plan that they're going to get up early in the morning before the people, poor people come and they're going to pick all the fruit from the trees so that when the poor people come, they'll see there's nothing there. They don't want to feed the poor. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did, because they were being very selfish in their actions, but also they're demeaning um, the people and how much this means to the poor, he burnt their orchard, he burnt their jannah. All right? And so how we know this comes from the ego, it also says in. They assumed they were able. They believed in themselves. And this is what led to their downfall. So how does this apply to us? Let's say we read a book or listening to a lecturer or a speaker and they say something that we don't agree with. 
If we were going to be loving and compassionate, we would approach them and tell them of our query. We'll be like, oh, you said this, but I'm not sure if this is right. This would be the good thing to do because what you're doing is you're showing them their faults or you're advising them. And this was one of the nine that Imam Sadiq told us about. However, most of us would be embarrassed of doing that because we'd be like, oh, they'll, they'll hate me, they'll, they'll think bad of me. And so instead of telling them and trying to fix their mistake or advising them, we start becoming skeptical of everything they say. Everything. We're like, oh, remember once they said this, was that right or not? And you start to do shek in everything they say. And by doing that, you're moving them away, away from you. And you're believing in them less and you start to lose trust in them. Unfortunately, these days, we see a lot of that happening to our ulama, where people are starting to doubt our ulama or being like, mm, I'm not really happy with this rule. I'm going to switch to another adam and yeah, this adam's not good. That's wrong, guys. They know way more than us. If we, there's something that we don't understand from their fatwa or we don't agree with, then we should ask them about it. They love to be asked questions. And the thing is, we also th see this in members of our community, the people who are trying to help us. They get a lot of backlash from us because we're like, mm, are they, is this really what's happening? Like this happens a lot with doctors, for example, the patient would come, they ask for the uh, doctor's opinion. The doctor gives them opinion, subscribing the medicine, but they're not convinced. So they go and check with six other doctors. That's wrong. All right. And so what we need to do again is look at the hadith of Imam al um, of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, which is Ahmed Akhaf al Mu'min ala Sabin Mahmanan. Do not assume. Never assume. So now that we've discussed these four, what did we get from this? We got that our ego is the cause of our demise. It is stopping us from actualizing our potential. So what we need to do is kill it. And one way, uh, the f given that we don't know how to do it, the first thing we need to do is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. And so we're going to give you a segment of Dara Makarim al Akhlaq by Imam Sajjad alayhi salam which tells us, which is um, a way of being able to do this. So what we're saying is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please do not let my ego rise up. If you gave the blessing to me that I should rise among the people, then make sure that you reduce myself in, in my eyes by the same degree that you raise me up in the people. In that way, we can stop our ego from inflating, inshallah. So why are we talking about the ego? The reason we're talking about the ego is because we can't even touch the divine universal soul without eradicating our ego. Our ego is the thing which stops us from even seeing the potential, seeing these traits and tools of the uh, universal soul being manifested. Remember we said that we can access them even if they're in potential, but we have no control. With our universal soul, it's even hard to access them because of our ego. So inshallah, we can get rid of it so that we don't fall in this trap. However, it's so hard in this society because our society today is based on growing your self-esteem, believing in yourself. It's been fed to our children all the time. How do we combat this? How can we stop ourselves from falling in this trap? 
thing is it's really hard because if we start following this path we're going to stick out like a sore thumb but we need to recognize that following the crowd of being the one against the crowd is not good but being with the crowd is also not good so you don't want to be out there telling people i don't believe in what you believe nor do you want to be following the people and believing in what they believe Islam and society are not at odds, but what you need to do is be able to balance both of them together. So it means to be incognito, hide among the crowd and follow them, but not to be swept up with them. Meaning that if you start moving and there's something ahead of you, like people are jumping off a cliff, you can turn away as quickly as possible. That's what we need to do. And we recognize that's hard. And Imam Ali alayhi salam told us that it's going to be hard. That the people do not shy away from the path of truth due to the little people who take it. He's telling us there are little people on the right path. But that should not stop us from going on. And that's the end of our lecture, inshallah. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The clip that we have for today is from an amazing TV show which made up our childhood. It was based from, based off a novel and they made it into a TV series and this is called Del Toro Quest. And so what it is is that there are three main characters um, who live in this world which has been taken over by a shadow lord, the shadow lord. And the shadow lord is pretty much the equivalent of Shaitan. He's evil and he is tyrannical and the havoc is spreading all over the land. However, they hold the only hope that there is to unite the people against the Shadow Lord, which is this thing called the Belt of Del Tora. And they have to collect the gems to put on this belt so that the people, the powers of all the gems can be powerful enough to stop the Shadow Lord. And this clip is uh, them trying to collect one of these gems, which is the diamond, okay? And so each of these gems is being guarded by an evil guardian who works for the Shadow Lord. And in this particular case, the guardian is called the guardian. So we're going to look at who this guardian is, and inshallah, you'll see how beautifully this matches up with today's lecture about the ego. refuse to enter the room and claim his prize. Standing where you are now, he told me that he and his cause, whatever that may be, wanted nothing that had been tainted by my possession. He left here cursing me with every step. That sounds like doom, and it would explain why he didn't want us to come to the valley in the first place. What about you? Will you collect your prize, or will you also run away in disgust now that you know who I really am? You must decide. Run away? We have no reason to run away. You promised us that if we won, we could take the diamond and leave. <laughs> Such confidence, my young friend. Be careful it doesn't blind you. Now then, pride. <laughs> Hate. <laughs> Envy. <laughs> Greed. What's going on? You lied to us. No, I didn't. You may leave with the diamond. However... I'd like you to leave all the other gems behind. Or did you think I was unaware of that belt you carry with you? Attack! Yeah. <laughs> 
You're all mine. And soon you're going to be very, very rich, aren't you? Not too bad for a one. Marina! They'll never let you leave! Hate to break it to you, Barda, but it looks like you're the ones who are never gonna leave. <laughs> That double crossing! But why are you letting her take it when she didn't even play the game? <laughs> it's not up to me. You must realize the diamond is the symbol of purity and strength. Gained honorably, it is a source of great power, but obtained for greed alone, it only brings misery. I see you bred the belt of Del Toro too. If you knew that, weren't you afraid it would do the same to you? I fear no such thing! The Shadow Lord granted me my powers to protect this valley and the diamond. I was chosen because I was not tempted by it. I am immune to its powers, for I am its guardian. You're not immune. You're a fool. The diamond's curse is already on you. Come on, he's right. Don't you realize? Living alone in this valley, surrounded by the living dead, is your punishment? It's a lie. I live in this palace as a king. Wake up, old man. Don't you say you're being used by the Shadow Lord? No, you've got it all wrong. It is I who am using him. The Heavenly Stone, a powerful talisman that breaks all manner of spells. <laughs> Shadow Lord, but his ego made him believe that no, I'm working for him, but I'm actually using him to benefit myself. So it's kind of like a triple illusion. So the real thing is that he is actually the slave, but he's alluded to think that no, he's not a slave, but he's doing what he wants and he's tricking the Shadow Lord in doing that. Yeah. And so why he had that is because he had an ego. He believed in himself and his intelligence and that kind of thing. And what that led is that it brought to life his pride, his envy, his greed, and his hate in true forms. What happened was when he touched the lapis lazuli, which removes the illusion, this illusion that, you know, he's in control, his pride, his envy, his greed, and his hate turned against him, and they started to attack him. And the reason for that is because he's recognized that these weren't helping him, but they were actually stopping him from achieving what he needs to do, or becoming a better person. They're the thing that stopped, that are stopping him and imprisoning him as the slave of the Shadow Lord. And it was, an only, it was only when he, was, he cut the ego, when they sliced all his attachments, that he was able to break free from these things that have grown out of, out of him. So, um, another thing that we can take out is... Um, 
Muhammad. So the other thing that we could take out from this clip is that girl that came in. So they've met her before in the show, she's a thief. And she comes in because she's greedy and she wants the diamond. And she leaves. And so Leaf asks, why can you let her leave? And he says, the diamond is the symbol of purity. Anybody who takes it unhonorably due to their greed will suffer. And later in other episodes, we do see that she suffers for it. So all these things, our ego only leads to our suffering once its purpose is over. So we really need to be able to cut ties with it so that we can ascend, inshallah. And that's the end. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.